Hello and welcome to the session on receptive skills and stories. Today we are going to talk about using stories while dealing with reading and listening in upper primary classes. Uh, my name is Anja Murcielak and I'm a teacher and teacher trainer from a very small town called Tarnowskie Góry, so I'm a small town girl. Um, today we are going to talk about receptive skills such as listening and reading and how we can prepare our sixth graders for their school leaving exam. So basically we are going to talk about reading and listening and how we can use stories to help our students prepare for the exam in a fun way. And our session is going to be divided into three parts. First, we're going to talk about how kids, primary pupils, learn. And then we're going to move on to receptive skills. <coughs> and finally, I'm going to show you a couple of activities that work with my students, that work with my classes, and how we can use them to prepare our students for the exam. Uh, I always, always stress the fact that those are the activities that work in my environment, but you are the experts when it comes to your students. So you know them best, and you know which activities might need changing, which need to be adapted. So it's always up to you because you are the expert when it comes to your students. So let's start. How do kids learn? How do primary students learn? Well, first of all, they learn through experience and it's either a positive or negative experience. So we have to make sure that the atmosphere on the lessons is a very friendly one, that they are not stressed that they are at ease, that they are relaxed. But how to do this when we know that we have to prepare them for an exam? They are only 11 and 12 and they still need to prepare for an exam. So we have to create this stress-free environment when we can engage them in a positive way. And we have to forget about the fact that we are preparing them for an exam. We have to forget about constant testing because they won't learn in such a stressful environment. Uh, they are able to absorb a lot of information, but they, they do not do it consciously. It's a subconscious process. It's not like with us adults. They won't be able to sit with a book and study a portion of material and learn it by heart. So we have to make sure that the experience is a positive one. Uh, what's more? They learn through all the senses. So we have to engage them. We have to engage all the learners, the auditory one, the visual one, and the kinesthetic ones. Because once all the senses are engaged, students learn best. And as you know, kids, they like to move a lot. They are very, very lively. And in most cases, they are kinesthetic learners. They like to do lively activities. They do not like to sit for 45 minutes on a lesson. They need variety. So we have to engage the sense of hearing, the sense of, the sense of sight, the sense of touch, even the sense of smell and taste if we can. What's more, we have to make sure that we revise the material constantly. When I ask my young learners, uh, do you remember present continuous tense? We talked about it about three months ago. 90% just look at me with blank faces. Huh? They don't remember. So we need to revise non-stop. We have to introduce new material, but we have to make sure that we also bring back the material studied before. And that's something we call linked learning. So we need to have little revisions at the beginning of the lesson, in the middle of the lesson, at the end of the lesson, so that we join the new material with the old one. And of course, we have to make sure that we, not, we are not only focused on the exam itself. Because very, very often, when we tell our students, okay, you need to do this activity because it's going to appear on your exam, we have to do this, you have only two minutes. 
they will be stressed. And this is taken from the exam brochure in Formato. And as you can see, even here, the importance of learning and teaching the language is stressed. So we have to remember that those are young learners and we are not only preparing them for an exam. The crucial element is to teach them life language, to teach them English, because otherwise we are going to kill the joy of learning a language. I don't know about you, but every time I have to pass an exam, I'm really, really stressed. And that's why I do not have a driving license. Because every time, yes, that's true, every time my teacher told me, you have to do this, otherwise you will fail. You have to do this for an exam. And I was so stressed that I actually ended up having three accidents on my driving lessons. So I think it works for the best that I don't drive. Plus, I gesture a lot anyway. So, as you can see, if we constantly remind them about the fact that it's going to appear on an exam and they have to study this for the exam, they will be stressed. And we do not learn well in a stressful environment. So, please have this little piece of the brochure in mind that we are teaching them English and we want them to enjoy the teaching and learning experience. When we encourage our students, when we remind them how good they are, when we tell them how much they have already accomplished, especially with very young learners and young learners, that can bring them <coughs> loss. It motivates them, it helps them learn, and they do not get discouraged. Because very often they think, oh my God, it's too difficult. I won't be able to do it. My teacher will criticize me. I will get the test with a bad mark. But once we show them what they can do, and what, with our encouragement, with the help of their friends, they are able to really, really achieve a lot. It is difficult sometimes. On the sixth lesson, you have a crazy group. They don't listen to you. They don't want to pay attention. They don't do their homework. They don't listen to what you're telling them to do. It's difficult. Sometimes we just want to like shout at the top of our head. But we should just praise the good behavior and show them what more they can achieve. I observed that when I do not criticize the students who do badly in the class, but I praise the one who did something well, the others, oh, they want to join. They want to be like that. So they think, oh, I didn't get criticized for my bad behavior, but I didn't get a sticker or a good mark or the teacher didn't smile to me. So if I do something well, I might be like Peter or Kate. And with their help, I can achieve a lot. So encouragement and positive reinforcement, positive feedback is the crucial element when teaching young learners. Not only young learners, of course, but mostly with young learners. Uh, so, receptive skills. Listening and reading. What do they mean? Well, receptive skills are also called passive skills because students are exposed to the text, either in a reading form or they have to listen to the text. And this is the input they get. Young learners, they absorb a lot of information, as I said before, uh, but they have to be exposed to it. Uh, I teach also very young learners from the ages of three to six, and very often I'm confronted with the parents who come to me and they say, oh, but I quiz him at home, I ask him a couple of questions, and he didn't know the answer. Well, yes, because first, young learners and very young learners, they need to listen to English. They need to listen to the stories. They need to listen to the stories read aloud. They have to be exposed to the language. And then the production of the language follows. Because from reading, we have writing. And from listening, we have speaking. So first we need to concentrate on the receptive skills and then the production, the active skills, the productive skills will follow. So as you can see, 
This is the input. Reading and listening are the receptive skills that are inserted into our learners and then they are able to produce the language themselves. Uh, why stories? I love using stories on my lessons because I think that they are a great source for both the language that they listen to, so they are exposed to the text read aloud, and they can also read on their own. Of course, I'm not asking my students, who are only 10 or 11, to read books in English. No, we listen to stories read aloud. We sometimes even watch the stories read aloud, because then the language is reinforced in both ways, because students listen to the language and they can see the captions or the pictures. They are great for motivation as well, also for revisions, because through stories we can revise a lot of material structures as well as vocabulary. We can also <coughs> use it for vocabulary recycling, because the stories incorporate more and more words that our students have already learned. What else? Well, imagination and creativity, of course. They are also great for confidence boosting. Because when we ask students to create stories, there are no wrong answers. They can create any story they like. If we ask them to read a story aloud, they can be in a role. They can play various characters. And once they put on a mask, they are no longer shy Peter or shy Kate. They are a fox of the story. So they can read in a different voice. I'm a huge advocate of dramatic books. So that's also something we can use while dealing with stories. <coughs> stories are also great for fluency, for oral fluency. When we practice reading and when students listen to the stories, it boosts their fluency a lot. What else? Well, as Dominika said, for practicing grammar, for using, talking about the language functions, language structures, and of course they are also great for writing, another skill that our students later on have to deal with, and for speaking, because they create a lot of discussion. Uh, listening, listening to stories uh, doesn't only mean hearing, because very often we talk to our students, they hear us, but do they listen to us? So what does listening mean? Well, listening means that you understand the story. You can somehow relate to the story. You can maybe retell it, in Polish even, but that means that you got the main idea of the story. How often does it happen that you meet a friend or you're with your family, they talk to you, you listen, you think you listen, but you're just hearing them. And later on, when they ask something, you're like, you didn't tell me that. I'm like that when my husband talks about his law cases. I hear him, but I don't listen to him. My brain kind of like goes to the venture. So we have to make sure that our students not only hear what we're saying, but we have to make sure that they listen to us that they understand what we want to say. They might not be able to retell the story in English, but even if they can tell us in Polish what the story is about, that's a great success because it means that they understood the story, they understood the text that they listened to. Uh, how does listening look like on the exam? Well, in your brochures, you already had the information that uh, reading and listening, so the receptive skills, they account for 65% of the exam, which is quite a lot. So let's start with listening. Listening comprehension on the exam. It means that there are 14 to 16 short tasks. The exercises, the tasks are close-ended ones, so there is a lot of true and false questions, also multiple choice questions and matching, of course. And listening accounts for 35% of the exam. That's quite a lot. 
That's quite a lot. So we have to bear that in mind while practicing listening on the lesson. Uh, we also are the sources of listening. Listening does not only mean putting on a CD and playing a listening. No, we are the sources. So we have to use English on our lessons with commands while we speak to students. They also are sources of listening themselves when they engage in short pair work, teamwork, and group work. So we all are sources for our students. If we do not want to play a CD, we can just read them a story or tell them a story. That's also listening. We can tell them a story while we're drawing, if you're good at that. If not, you can tell a story and ask students to draw a short cartoon or comic for you. I'm not a good drawer myself. I, I don't draw very well. So I would ask my students to listen to me, maybe in teams, and to draw the story for me. On YouTube, there are so many wonderful short videos when a story is read aloud. Sometimes you can see people flipping the pages of the book or acting the story out. The story is read aloud, but students can also see the pictures and they can also follow with the text. So they can see how the word is written and how the word is pronounced. And you can find thousands of stories on YouTube. Really, anything you want. Short rhymes, nursery rhymes, songs, poems, very short stories, and as I said, sometimes they are acted out or read aloud in a very dramatic, theatrical way. Or you can see kids reading the story and flipping the pages of the book. And that's a great fun for the kids. Uh, let's move on to reading. Uh, I found a quote saying that reading is like swimming. And I really like that. Why? Because there are so many words and students are afraid they might drown. So they just, just dip their toes in the water. They like the shallow part. Or they just like to float on the water. They do not want to dive in. That's too dangerous. Too many words. You can get lost. You can drown in the text. So I really like that comparison because it shows how difficult reading can be for our students. Reading is such a complicated process. <laughs> there are so many strategies for reading. We can read when we want to look for details, for specific information. We sometimes just scheme or scan. We have to know the context. We have to know the vocabulary, and sometimes we, can, we have to guess the meaning of the words or the meaning of the sentences from the context. So it's such a complex process. And while dealing with reading, we have to remember that on the exams, students do not have all the time in the world, but again, we do not want to make them feel stressed. So we cannot just say, okay, you have five minutes, do the task, read the text, do the task. They will be stressed. No, let's start slowly. Okay, you have two minutes to read the text just to get the general idea. Can you tell me what the text is about? Is it a funny text? Is it a text about school? About a jungle maybe? So just guess. Okay, now you have five minutes. Look for specific information in the text. Spend more time. So we have to go over all the strategies. Very often students just look at the text. They do not want to read the text. They don't want to dive into this text. We have to make them aware of the fact that they have to read the whole text. Not only guess what the text can be about. That's the first stage. Then they have to read the text. Uh, and what about reading on the exam? Well, reading accounts for 30%. So listening, 35%. Reading accounts for 
30%. And just like with listening, there are close-ended tasks. So that means true and false, multiple choice questions, and marching. And there are less tasks because there are 10 up to 12 tasks on the exam itself. <coughs> we, as I said, have to make sure that our students are exposed to the written word, not only talk to them so that they listen to us using English, but very often in a classroom we have students who are what I call fast finishers. They finish the task and they are bored. What do I do now? They start to get naughty, they don't want to concentrate, they disturb the other students. So what do we do? If we have a colorful classroom, a classroom with posters, maybe with weather forecasts, with dictionaries, with any pictures that are signed in English, then they start looking around. And they read when they are bored or when they finish before the rest of the class. So let's make sure that our classes are as colorful and that they use as much language as possible because students are exposed to the language and they are able to know, oh, I know this word. It's actually on this poster. Sometimes they, of course, use it on the tests as well when they have the tests in our classes. Oh, yeah, I want to write the test in this classroom because it has a really nice dictionary so I can cheat a little bit. Well, that's not cheating. That's using the resources that they have available. So let's make sure that our classes are really, really colorful and there is as much language as possible. Uh, what else? Well, extensive reading is also very important. But how to make sure that our kids read at home? What they want to do at home is they want to play on their tablets or laptops or smartphones. So we have to encourage them to combine this law for mobile devices together with the love of reading. And nowadays, we have so many resources available, so we have to make sure we get to all our students. And I don't know if you're familiar with this website, Oxford Owl. It's a very, very useful page. Uh, it has about 250 books, e-books and audiobooks, and you just go to this address and we are going to have a look at reading and of course you have ebooks or audiobooks not only for your laptops but also for your tablets so students are able to read a book on the tablet or laptop and they are also able to listen to the book read aloud. It helps a lot. It helps with, uh, with vocabulary. It also helps the struggling learners because this is something they can do at home. So there is no pressure of time. The teacher doesn't say you have to do it now, you have only five minutes. No, they can do it in their homes whenever they feel like it. What does it look like? Well, you can choose a book and you can decide whether you want to choose using the ages category or the book type or the series. But this site was designed for native uh, learners. So sometimes the books for students who are 9 to 10 might be too difficult for our students. So we can just use the ones for 7 or 8 year old ones because we want to encourage them to read. And here an example of a book. As you can see, there is the audio, but you also see the book. This one is on sports. So that's a very, very useful site because you can pause anytime you want. You can go back, you can listen to the book again and again. So you make sure that you find something that's easy for you and something that's also interesting for you. Okay, let's move on to the practical part of the session. 
the exam. How to prepare students in a fun, friendly, stressless way and how to make sure that we get to all our students. I always say that teachers need superpowers, right? Because we have so many kids, we have to make sure that our lessons are friendly, stressless, informative, that we are motivating our students, plus we are preparing them for an exam. Superpowers. We're just great. So how do we do it? Uh, I will share a couple of techniques and activities that work with my students, but as I said, you can adapt them, you can change them, tweak them. You have to find the ones that will work in your environment because you know your students, you know the sizes of your groups, you know what works best for them. Uh, I divided this part into three other parts. So we are going to talk about the pre-task activities, the on-task activities, and the post-task activities. So what do I mean by pre-task activities? Those are activities and tasks that we give to our students in order to create interest in the story, in the text that they are going either to read or listen to. We also want to focus our student on what is going to come next. And we also want them to predict what's going to happen. So let's have a look at a text that you read and listen to. What can we do with it as a pre-task activity? Well, first of all, there are so many pictures. So our students can guess where does the story take place. There is a bus, there is a bird, a jungle. So what is the story about? So we talk about the vocabulary, we talk about the places where the story takes place. And they are, so to say, prepared for what's about to come. And the leading in part is very, very important because, as I said, we set up the context for the story. So we prepare our students, we make it user-friendly, so to say. And we also activate prior knowledge. Oh, there is a bus, a bus, a bus driver, driving. So students activate what they already know about this activity, about driving, for example. We also, as I said before, create interest in this story. Why was there a bus, a parrot, and a jungle? The story must be exciting. What else? Students predict the content. So what is the story about? Is it a horror story or an action story? What is it going to talk about? And also, we pre-teach the vocabulary. Some students might say, oh, it's a bus. Others might say, no, it's a car. So we talk about the problematic areas when it comes to vocabulary. Um, this is one of the activities that I like to use with my students. I give them those little plastic eggs that you get from the chocolate ones. There are tons of them at home. Uh, and I just hide something inside. It's either a small object, a sticker, or maybe just a piece of paper with an English word. I divide my students into groups and I say, okay, so I'll open the eggs and tell me, what can the story be about? You found a parrot or you found a shell. So is the story about holiday, about seaside, about swimming, about hobbies, shell collecting? So I create interest. And also what's important, once you give them a slip of paper, they just look at it. If you give them a plastic egg, they calm down. They have to stop for a moment, even like two seconds. They have to open the plastic egg. So it creates this element of surprise. Very easy idea, but works wonders with young learners. What else? They can also talk and predict what the story is about, looking at those objects. Oh, I have a funny elephant. So. Is it a sad, scary, funny love story? Or maybe it's a funny story. Or maybe it's a love story because I have an elephant and a parrot. So 
So they guess. Also, where does it take place? I have a bus or I have a word that says school. So maybe it takes place in a school building or maybe somewhere else. Who are the main characters? Well, maybe the elephant. Maybe the owner of the elephant will be one of the main characters. And also, what's the problem? So they predict what the story is going to be about. Uh, I also like to use sound effects. I ask them to have a look at various sound effects and it's funny for them because they always get confused. Why does hooray means hurrah? How do you spell it? So I tell them, okay, so look at those sound effects. So can you guess? Oops, hooray. So maybe it's a funny story after all. Maybe it's not a love story. So it creates interest. Let's move on to the on task activities or so to say whilst reading, whilst listening activities. Well, they encourage students to interact with the text and also they are user friendly. So we want to make sure that our students actually understand either the text that they have read or the text that they have listened to. So what do I do with my students? Well, we use post-it notes. I love post-it notes. They are great for everything. So, we use post-it to show our favorite part and they just place a sticker or a post-it note in the place where they like the part of the story. And we also use it to identify tricky words. So when you look at the text, they are full of those little post-it notes. That's how do you deal with the written word. What else? Well, we use popsicle sticks and they have numbers, so students have to match the parts of the story, the beginning, the end, and it helps them follow the story. Uh, we also use an activity that energizes students. As you can see, I'm a very lively person. I try not to move too much. I really try, but it's just stronger than me. And I move a lot, so my students are very lively as well. And I use this activity that energizes them, that wakes them up. They listen to a text read aloud, and I tell them, every time you hear the word jungle, stand up. Or every time you hear the word parrot, clap your hands. Sometimes I divide them into groups. Okay, when you hear parrot, you stand up. When you hear jungle, you clap your hands. Or I make it even more complicated. When you hear the word parrot, stand up and say pigeon. When you hear the word jungle, stand up and say school. So they change the story. And the beauty of this activity is that because they do it in groups, they are not stressed. It's not me, only me, who has, who has to stand up. No, the whole group stands up. So even if I don't know the answer, even if I didn't hear the word jungle, all my friends stood up, so that means that I have to stand up. And they listen, they focus on the story. So that's one of the activities that worked in my classroom. Uh, what else? Post-reading activities. In my opinion, the most important ones. Because now we actually check whether our students understood the text whether they understood the story, not only heard it or read it very quickly. We make sure that they know the vocabulary. We make sure that they know how to interact and respond to the story, how to tell it in their own world, words, and maybe even create a new one. So we keep a story jar, and there are actually a couple of story jars in my classroom. Sometimes we just put put words connected with the story. Students draw a word, for example, jungle, and they say, this story is in a jungle, or this story is about the jungle, or we just cut sentences from the story and students have to put them in order. So it's like a jumbled order activity. So as I said, we have a couple of story jars and we just use them 
for retelling the story or creating a new one or recalling the vocabulary. What else? Bracelets. We create small bracelets out of wooden beads uh, and there are parts of the bracelet. The beginning, this is the pink bead, then the middle, three green, the two green ones, and the end. So students have this bracelet and they have to tell the story using this bracelet. It's easier for them because they associate certain parts with words. What else? Story stones. My daughter collects stones, lots of them. They are in every pocket of her jacket and they are in every box of her room and we have to transport them when we travel. It's a very <laughs> complicated issue. And I always steal those stones and the bigger ones are used on my lessons either with stickers, so as you can see here, I just place some tiny stickers on the stones or if you're talented, you can draw something with a permanent marker, with a sharpie and it stays on the stone and students either are in groups or sit in a circle, they take one of the story stones ooh, that's the parrot, yes, the parrot was the main character of the story, the parrot is big or the parrot was green, is green actually because they don't know past simple that well so they have to retell the story using story stones it's also great for those students who have to fidget non-stop because they can have something, hold something in their head and they retell the story uh, what else? As I said, drama is something I love. So we act the story out. We act the dialogues out, either in groups. So for example, there, there are five parrots and they have to read the line for the parrot at the same time. It also takes this pressure out of performing because there are five of us, so that's easier. And I ask them, I encourage them to use crazy voices. You're a parrot, come on, you're going to move differently. You're going to talk differently. And the key element is that I join them. I always join my students, I make a fool of myself, and once they see that the teacher is not afraid to be perceived in a strange way, or is not afraid to walk like a parrot, then they just join, and they laugh. And the pressure, the stress is lifted. Uh, another drama activity, can you guess? Freeze frame. So students recreate <coughs> parts of the story as a kind of freeze frame. Polish word stop klatka might show it better. Freeze frame. Uh, which part of the story is it? Oh, the parrot is sitting on the bus, for example or the parrot is eating something. So they create those freeze frames and the rest of the class, they have to guess which part of the story that was. Uh, we also play a lot of games. Here you can see a game which is connected with the text about the jungle. So students have to recreate the story by playing a game. Also, we create posters, posters, word clouds, mind maps, but very colorful ones. And we put them all around our classroom. Also to expose my students to the written word, to as much English as possible. Uh, and what else? We create story maps. So it's either students who create those maps, or I just draw a very, very basic one. We talk about the setting, and they always have a little picture that helps them with understanding. So the setting means where does it take place, characters, beginning, also the next part, and the end. So they re recreate the story, they talk about the story, they can write it as a follow-up activity. Again, it's up to you. You decide what would be the best option for your classes. I also asked a couple, asked a couple of my friends uh, to tell me why they use stories. And I love those quotes. They said that stories are really, really powerful, especially when learning and teaching English. Also, the joy of storytelling is universal. That's true. And if students tell us personal stories, it motivates them. 
because this is the language that's relevant to them. And last but not least, everyone knows stories, well, good ones. All the quotes are taken from ELT chat. I don't know whether you use Twitter, but there is a great um, community called ELT chat that gathers uh, twice a week and discusses various issues and that was taken from the discussion on stories, using stories for boosting uh, receptive skills as well as productive skills. Uh, and let's bear in mind the most important thing that I wanted to show you today. That preparation for exam is important, but it's not the most important thing. We have to make sure our students love the language and are interested in the language itself because later on we will get workers like that. I see you did well in school, but what real world skills do you have? Tests. I can take tests. So let's make sure that doesn't happen with our students. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much.